PJTN's goal is to arm Christian media with programs to fight this media war against the lies and misinformation that is targeted against Israel. Tonight, we are honored to have such distinguished guests to communicate this message, which leads me to our guest speaker, Dennis Prager. Mr. Prager serves as one of PJTN's distinguished international advisory board members. He is also a nationally recognized conservative radio talk show host who has been outspoken in support of Jewish Christian relations and support for Israel and her right to the land. Please join me in welcoming Dennis Prager. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Lori and PJTN, where I'm honored to be on your International Advisory Board. I'm, I have so much to talk to you about, uh, uh, both with regard to uh, Israel and PJTN and with regard to uh, national religious broadcasting in general. I would, I'd like to try to combine them both in the time that I have. Uh, I want to tell you, if somebody were to ask me what the greatest single message I have had in my 30 years of consecutive broadcasting, half of the time in LA and half the last half nationally based in Los Angeles, I, I can tell you, and that is the consequences of secularism. Nobody, well not nobody, that's, I take that back, jury. Most people don't talk about that. And I, I'll give you a very good proof. Every one of you has heard the term religious extremist. And for good reason. There are religious extremists. They exist in all of our religions. But have any of you ever heard the term secular extremist? I'll bet not. Now how could that be? How could there be only extremism in one direction, but not at all in the other? And of course, the reason is those who create our political vocabulary are overwhelmingly secular extremists, and they see themselves as moderates, not as extremists, because they don't believe it's possible to be too secular. You can be too religious, but you cannot be too secular. And I have been trying to make my audience, and mine is a, a, a general show, not, not a specifically religious show, but I have tried over the course of my lifetime to both write and talk about the consequences of secularism. See, uh, we, we correctly extol the virtues of secular government, but that's the ending of secularism's blessings. A secular life is not a blessing. A secular government may be, but not a secular society. The United States was not founded to be secular. It was founded to be a God-based society, and uh, we, our abandoning of that, our abandoning of that is a calamity. I want to discuss with you in the time that I have how these two are related, this, the Israel issue and the secularization of society issue. Secularization of society, the death of God, if you will, to put it in popular parlance, is a calamity. I, I have given the term for the American value system, the subject of my last book and the subject of my life, the American Trinity. Christianity has a trinity, as you well know. Uh, Judaism has a trinity, which you may not know. Most Jews don't know, but I grew up in yeshiva and I learned it. We didn't call it a trinity, but we sang it, we stated it. God, Torah, Israel are one. Just as a three, there's a three-in-one, as it were, in Christianity, there's a three-in-one in Judaism, God, Torah, Israel. The universities uh, have a trinity, race, gender, and class. It seems that trinities seem to make things work. And uh, the United States has a trinity, the American trinity, and I didn't realize this until about 20 years ago when, uh, like the Greek philosopher who came to discoveries in his bathtub, uh, unpacking my uh, trousers one night, I, I looked at the coins that I had just taken out of my pants pockets and realized that the American value system had been staring me in the face since I was a child. 
liberty in God we trust, and e pluribus unum. That's the American Trinity. There is no other country in the world that has had those three values as its center values. France gave us liberty, equality, and fraternity. We have, in God we trust, e pluribus unum and liberty. Did you know, I'll bet most of you don't know unless you've actually been to the halls of Congress. I didn't know this, student of American life my whole life. I didn't know this till I went to hear uh, this president. I was invited by a congressman to sit in the gallery for a, an address to both houses in the, in, in the House of Representatives. Every one of you has seen the Vice President of the United States and the Speaker of the House sitting behind a, every given president who speaks to both houses of Congress. Did you know that about 15 feet, 10 feet above those two people, chiseled in gigantic letters on the marble wall of Congress, are the words, in God we trust? I didn't know it. You didn't know it. And you know why? They never pan out. Never. Which is odd when you think about it, isn't it? The, the video news people never, ever pan out and show you a, the large scene. You get the large scene of the audience, but never of the president, vice president, and, and speaker of the house. So you never see that. I was, I was shaken. That's all a member of Congress sees when the president speaks, in God we trust. And my congressman friend told me the president is facing a sculpted Moses giving the Ten Commandments. <laughs> but hey, we were founded to be secular, weren't we? It's a lie. We're taught a lie in college. We're taught a lie in high school, and the, I call it the L word because to me it's a dirtier word than the B word or whatever you want. Lie is a terrible thing to accuse people of. But we have been lied to that America was founded to be secular, and vast numbers of Americans believe this, and the consequences are devastating in every aspect of life. On the personal they, they absolve you of meaning. There is no meaning. If there is no God, I mean, atheists acknowledge this. I've debated some of the biggest atheists from Oxford to the United States, and they acknowledge. Of course, if there's no God, there's no meaning to life. Of course not. We're just coincidences in a universe that couldn't care less about us. We live a tiny, nothing period of time, and then we become as insignificant as a grain of sand or a grain of, of rock on Pluto. We're nothing. It's meaningless. Don't think this hasn't had an effect in the Western world, this nihilism that life is meaningless. One of the consequences of secularism and its meaninglessness is the fact that secular people don't have children. See, you're taught at college that the reason that people don't have children in the modern age is economic. How come rich Orthodox Jews, rich traditional Catholics, rich evangelical Christians, rich Mormons have a lot of children. How come? Doesn't make sense, does it? If I told you that there's a couple and they have six children, an American couple, same couple. I just want to clarify that, unfortunately. Same couple, six children. You know you would assume they're one of those four groups. You would just assume they're religious. And you would be right. There are two reasons if you're secular not to have children. First, it's a pain in the ass. I mean, let's be honest, right? You have less sex, you have less uh, dining out. Like, you know, the, the, the prices that you pay for having children, they're enormous. And since life doesn't mean anything anyway, the purpose is to eat out as often as possible. I'm going to miss a cruise for the sake of having children? What, are you nuts? And this is all perfect. Russia is disappearing. Germany is disappearing. You want to hear one of the ironies of history? At the rate things are going, there will be more Jews than Germans at the end of this century. I'm not saying that to celebrate it. I am not. I just want to tell you the irony 
of ironies. You'll make of it what you wish, but that is exactly the demographic trend. Spain is disappearing. Italy is disappearing. Spain and Italy, two of the most Catholic countries in Europe. But the new generation has just dropped Catholicism, and they, uh, they live with mom and dad. Why make a family? We don't, we don't understand, the, we, don't eat our, we don't begin to grasp the terrible consequences of the death of God in Western society in every area of life. Wisdom, I told the advisory board of, uh, or the, many of the, the donors and helpers of PJTN earlier this evening, I, I told them, and you could see it on the internet, just look it up, Prager, How I Found God at, at Columbia. In graduate school at Columbia University, I was, I was hounded, I was haunted. I really was by the, this realization. I was being taught by very, very bright people. I was being taught drivel, nonsense, stupidity, forgive me. Nice people, I, uh, this is not ad hominem. They were nice people. They were often brilliant but they were foolish. I was taught, and, and, and I always give these examples, how I, I was taught, uh, for example, that the United States and the Soviet Union were equally responsible for the Cold War. And my favorite, I was taught that men and women are basically the same. That's right. PhDs were teaching me what my grandmother, who never graduated elementary school, knew was not true, that boys and girls are not different. Hey, the only reason boys don't play with tea sets and they prefer what they prefer are soldiers or toy guns or, uh, or whatever they prefer. The only re trucks, locomotives, is that they got a sexist upbringing. It was so powerful, this belief, that the president of Harvard acknowledged, to his great credit, Larry Summers, in the Obama cabinet and in the, uh, in the excuse me, in the Clinton cabinet, and a major advisor to President Obama, lifelong liberal, president of Harvard, acknowledged in a speech that he raised his daughters in a non-sexist way. So he tells the following story: that in so doing, that I don't remember if it was Christmas or Hanukkah, I don't know what religion he is. But he, he gave his daughter, who was about 10 years old, trucks for the holiday. After a few hours, he realized that her room was very quiet. So he was a little concerned. He knocked on the door, and she opens it, and she says, Shh, Daddy, they're sleeping. <laughs> she had, get one truck was a daddy truck, and one truck was a baby truck. Know what boys do with trucks? They don't put them to sleep. <laughs> you have to go to graduate school to believe that boys and girls are basically the same. Such stupidity is unavailable to the uneducated mind. <laughs> when I hear, when I hear, when a caller calls me and speaks well and says something stupid, this, I've been doing this for decades. I will say, just curious, what graduate school did you go to? And the caller will say, well, why do you ask? He said, because had you not gone to graduate school, you would not have said something that foolish. And, and, and I never humiliate listeners. It's a very big deal. I am known for being kind to listeners and to guests I disagree with. And it's not to attack them. I'm attacking graduate school. And so finally, at Columbia, realizing, I realized I was being taught all this nonsense. One day, walking on 116th Street and Broadway, all of a sudden, the answer came to me from a phrase from the Bible that I had learned in yeshiva, religious Jewish school that I attended till 18, from kindergarten. And it's part of the Jewish prayer service that was taken from the Bible. And ne nearly all of you, or all of you will know of it. And all of a sudden, I knew the answer to the problem of the lack of wisdom at the university. Reshit chachma yirat Adonai. We used to say it every day, but it meant nothing to me because it was just a rote phrase. And it means wisdom begins with fear of God. No God, no wisdom. And that is given. That is the reason. 
That is what has happened in Western society. No, insti there are individuals who have wisdom who are atheists, undoubtedly. But societal, society and its institutions, no secular institution produces wisdom. They produce knowledge, but not wisdom. When I talk on my radio show, when a 15-year-old, a 12-year-old calls me up, I know within 20 seconds whether the kid was raised in a religious home or not. And I'm batting a thousand because I actually write it down or, or on my, uh, on my talkback mic, I tell the engineer or tell my producers, kids in a religious home, and sure enough, I will then ask the kid, are you raised in a religious home? Yes. Because they, they actually have learned what the secular baby boomers taught to be untrue. Remember, don't trust anyone over 30. That means, what does that mean, do not trust anyone over 30? It means there is no such thing as wisdom, because all wisdom comes from brighter minds and ages that have called it great. How do we know what is great art? If it survives over the course of, of centuries, over generations. Same with ideas, wisdom. There's no wisdom if you don't believe in anything over 30. Every one of us in this room providing, and I assume nearly everyone here is, is religious. By that very fact that you're religious, it means you've announced something thousands of years old has something to teach me. It's called the Bible. It's laughed at at Harvard. It is laughed at at Columbia. It is laughed at at your local university. Laughed at. Not merely disregarded, laughed at. I am going to learn something from a 2,000, in the case of the New Testament, 3,000 case of the Old Testament document? Give me a break. I don't learn anything from people over 30 years old. I'm going to learn something from something 2,000, 3,000 years old? There is no wisdom at the university, and that's the reason. There's knowledge. But there's knowledge on, my, on the internet, there's knowledge on my hard drive, but there's no wisdom on my hard drive. So the consequences of the death of God, of death of God are spectacular. And the worst of all is no God, no religion, no morality. Not that atheists are immoral. There are beautiful atheists and there are despicable religious people. I, I want to make that clear. I've never in my life said you can't be moral if you don't believe in God. What I have said, and this apparently sails right over college graduates' minds, is if there is no God, there is no good and evil. There are only opinions about good and evil. So we now live, and this is the worst consequence perhaps of all, of secularism. We live in the age of feelings. There was an age of reason, there was the age of enlightenment, there was the renaissance. We now live in the age of feelings. Feelings uber alles. Feelings over everything. How do you feel about it? Not is there a right and is there a wrong. How do you feel about it? David Brooks in the New York Times reviewed the, the studies, the literature, and, and said there's just universal conclusion, kids don't no longer think in America in moral terms. In other words, they don't think of the question, is it right, is it wrong? There is no right and wrong independent of them. This, this is to us who are religious, who know that there is a good and evil that transcends our opinion infinitely so. It's, un it's unbelievable news, but it's not. it shouldn't be unbelievable. If there is no God, there is no right and wrong that transcends the individual. Where does it come from? DNA? Where is, de where is good and evil? Where do you find it? Where it can you measure it? Can you find it in, in, a, in, in some evolutionary cup? So it's all, how do you feel about it? I learned this, uh, and I've spoken about this my whole life. In my 20s, when I began lecturing, I asked high school students who were then 10 years younger than me. And I would ask them if you were, uh, if you were walking by a body of water, river, lake, ocean, and you're walking with your dog, whom you love, 
All of a sudden, you noticed your dog is drowning. Dog had run into the water and was drowning. And a hundred feet from your dog, a stranger, a person you didn't know was drowning. Which would you say first? Two-thirds in all the years I have asked this voted against the person. One-third voted for the person. Ask, ask, go to a high school today and ask the question. Go to a college today and ask the question. Ask it to these, these people are now parents themselves. Ask them. And you know their answer, why they would save their dog first? I love my dog. I do not love the stranger. Feelings uber alles. Love, hey, is in love everything? Now, why would I save a stranger before one of the two dogs that I have? And I can't say I love them, my wife loves them, I like them. But still in all, I like them more than I like the stranger, right? I have no feelings towards the stranger, zero. But I want you to know I would save any of you, not only before my dogs, but even before my beloved stereo system. <laughs> That's a real test, because I really do love my stereo system. Now, why is that? You know why? Because I wouldn't do what I felt like doing. I would do what is right. Humans are created in God's image. Dogs are not. End of issue. There is no other reason in the world to save the stranger. There is no secular, compelling reason to save the stranger you don't love over the dog you do. That is why we live in such an age of moral confusion because of the death of God. And it is true everywhere, everywhere. No God, no meaning, no God, no wisdom, no God, no compelling moral standard. It's all how you feel. Everything has become feelings. <laughs> I gotta tell you the way I learned Again, from my yeshiva training, fourth grade. This is this one of the great, it's, uh, I'm writing my autobiography, which I feel silly to say because I still think I'm a kid. Kids shouldn't write autobiographies, but I'm not a kid, so I'm writing it. And it's one of my favorite stories. Fourth grade, yeshiva, Rambam, Brooklyn, New York. The uh, rabbi announces to the class, boys, it's time to daven mincha. It's time for the afternoon prayer. I walked over to the rabbi very respectfully, but I said, uh, Rabbi, uh, I'm not in the mood <laughs> to daven mincha. The rabbi was an East European Orthodox Jew, and he knew English, but I'm sure he had never heard the word mood and pray in the same sentence. And, he thought and he thought and he thought, he even closed his eyes, and finally he said, Dennis Prager is not in the mood to daven mincha. So what? <laughs> I'm telling you, that changed my life. What he said to me was, my feelings don't matter. My behavior matters, not my feelings. That should, be the, the, that should be what we teach, but in the age of the death of religion, feelings are everything, because there is no right or wrong. How do you feel about it? That's the self-esteem movement. How do you feel about yourself? That's what self-esteem is. So here's the interesting news. By the way, again, cultivated, I remember the man who did it, John Vasconcello, state senator of California. I interviewed him at the time in the 70s. Good secular man resented his Catholic upbringing, which didn't give him high self-esteem, he said. Obviously, it gave him enough self-esteem to be a state senator. <laughs> I, you know, I find that a little odd, but, the, but a nun wrapped him one day, and, you know, he's never lived, uh, li you know. I, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, don't start me on Catholics who were 80 years later still angry at a nun. Uh, it's, as an outsider, I find it fascinating. Anyway, uh, so uh, this, this, uh, this was the whole thing. It was about how do you feel about yourself. That's why my son, when he was 10, 11 years old, he was on the worst baseball team in his league, got a trophy. Got a trophy. I said, David, what's the trophy for? He said, for playing. I said, for what? 
I said, Dave, did your team win? No. Did you do well? Struck out three times. Why'd you get a trophy? For playing. You shouldn't get a trophy for playing. It's like getting a trophy for breathing. We don't honor people for breathing. You're honored for an achievement. There is no achievement if you don't win in baseball. None, zero, nada, nothing. Americans and seven other students uh, from uh, uh, seven countries, not seven other students, seven other countries, students were tested in math. Americans came in seventh, industrialized democracies. Came in seventh out of seven. But on the question, how do you feel about your knowledge of math, they came in first. Okay? Feelings, another consequence of secularism. How do you feel about it? Yes. Forgive me, this may uh, strike some of you as uh, risque, but uh, I'll say it anyway. I wrote a column. I wrote a nationally syndicated column, and about three, four years ago, I wrote a column, and uh, I took my rabbi from the fourth grade's advice and this feeling that this belief that feelings should not be the only determinant of conduct and I wrote a two-part column to women two wives and it was titled when you're not in the mood <laughs> so what Now, I just have to tell you, uh, you will love this. You, this. This is priceless. You're the first to hear this one. Last night, I spoke in California to a, to a beautiful organization that, that uh, works to help pregnant women decide to uh, not have an abortion and those who did have an abortion to work through religious ways. It's a beautiful Christian organization. I was the keynote speaker, and I told this story to them. My wife was present, and she told me that the couple next to her, a, a, a middle-aged, lovely couple, uh, and uh, he applauded profusely. <laughs> and she caught from, the, from the, her peripheral vision the wife putting her hand gently on his hands, not to clap so loud. It was a priceless moment. I wish I could have videoed their response. But you know what? Ju the Jewish uh, Talmudic law actually specifies uh, that there are obligations in sex in marriage. It's not feelings. And what does Paul say about the, the, the man's body belonging to his wife and the, the wife's body belonging to her husband, right? So we come from uh, r religion. Religion doesn't say you have sex just when you feel like it. That's secular. So every area of life, every area of life, secularism has affected. I'll give you one more example, and then I'm going to go to the Middle East. Uh, and, uh, and that is art. I'm very, very involved in classical music. I periodically conduct orchestras in Southern California. I thought of majoring in music, uh, and I, I am fairly knowledgeable of it. I am convinced, I am absolutely convinced that the death of God has been the death of classical music. Most, nearly all 20th century post Schoenberg music is junk. Not all, nearly all. Certainly all of the atonal, except Berg's violin concerto. Uh, by the way, Leonard Bernstein, no, no religious man, said the same thing. He said atonal music is an oxymoron. And look at art. You know what the featured exhibit, uh, the, the, the featured sculpture at the uh, Orange County? This is Orange County, considered conservative in California. Orange County Museum of Art, the big museum of art in Orange County, California. You look this up, you can see a picture of it. 27 foot sculpture of a dog urinating. That's, the, that's in the front of the museum. And I mean urinating, there's a yellow a band that comes out of his penis. Germany, one of the biggest art awards, went to a sculpture of a policewoman 
uh, crouching and peeing on the ground, and the, he sculpted the yellow puddle underneath her. Won one of the biggest art awards in Germany. Bach and Haydn, my two favorite composers, on almost every manuscript wrote to the, greatest, to the greater glory of God on the top of their manuscript. When you, when you sculpt to the glory of God, you don't sculpt peeing people or peeing dogs. So it's a big deal, folks. It's a big deal. It's an empty world, the secular world. A lot of nice people. Your, bro- your secular brother-in-law is probably a wonderful husband. This is not ad hominem. It's ad societum, if you will. How does this, how does this, uh, how does this touch the Middle East? The moral confusion, the lack of wisdom. Today's moral, uh, today's moral litmus test. Every generation has a moral litmus test. Today it is Israel. By the way, very often the Jews end up the moral litmus test. Not because Jews are better than anybody else, but in my opinion, because the Jews are the chosen people. And uh, that's a role Jews don't like to play, didn't ask for it. Tevye in uh, uh, Fiddler on the Roof says, why don't you choose somebody else for a change? (laughs) Jews have felt that. God himself wasn't sure he chose right. I mean, it's a lot of ambivalence between God and the Jews historically. This week's portion that I taught in my synagogue was all about God saying, Moses, I'll, I'll get rid of them. I'll make a new people out of you. He wasn't happy with us. We weren't happy with him. And not much has changed in the last 4,000 years. But uh, we are the chosen people. And never forget, this was one of the great moments of my life as well. My first radio show in 1982 to 1992, I was the moderator of a program on ABC Radio in Los Angeles called Religion on the Line. And I had each week a different rabbi, a different priest, different minister, uh, different ones each week. And then the second five years, I included every week a fourth religion, uh, whatever it might be, Mormon or uh, uh, Muslim, whatever it might be. So I got a real great education, and I fell in love with a lot of clergy, and I learned Christianity from the mouths of people who truly believed in it. It was a wonderful experience. One time, a... uh, a caller called in and gave the rabbi a very hard time. Oh, rabbi, how do you believe the Jews are the chosen people? That is, that is chauvinistic. That is racist. Uh, it's arrogant. And the rabbi was a good liberal rabbi, and I mean good. It was a wonderful man. And it was clear he was not comfortable with chosenness either. But he was representing Judaism, and what is he going to do? So he poorly defended it. Finally, the Catholic priest says, uh, Dennis, uh, this is Father Mike. May I uh, respond to the caller? I said, Father, please go right ahead. And he said as follows, uh, Caller, this is Father Michael Nasita, Roman Catholic priest. God chose the Jews. Get a life. <laughs> it was truly one of the great moments of my life. I will never forget it as long as I live. Uh, so when I say the Jews are the litmus test, it is not because I'm Jewish and it is not because of, uh, of Jews being better than anybody else. It's just that's the way it's, it's worked out. If you hate Jews, that is a perfect litmus test. It just is. Those who have hated Jews, have nice people ever been Jew haters? I don't think so. All right? It's not like Hitler was a great guy but for this quirk. He was a bad guy, and the quirk proved it, and had the world, had non-Jews understood that Jew hatred, that anti-Semitism, is the great indicator of the moral worth of the hater, 100 million non-Jews would have lived. But they dismissed Hitler as the Jews' problem, because non-Jews are just as stupid as Jews. That's why most people aren't deep. So they don't know. It's tempting to say Hitler is a Jewish problem. Ahmadinejad is an Israeli problem. Not mine. Not America's. Not Brazil's. Not France's. Israel's. It's tempting. Fools, it's tempting. Not you, obviously, wouldn't be here. But that's my address to the world. You're nice, you're sweet, and you're foolish. And it's suicidal. Jew haters start with Jews, but they never end with Jews. 
and I might add, second in line are Christians. First, it's the Saturday people, and then it's the Sunday people, as was said very often in the Arab world. Look at what's happening to Christians in the Arab world. Ain't reported much in the New York Times, is it? An Orthodox rabbi, Orthodox rabbi in Los Angeles, Rabbi Yitzhak Adlerstein, just wrote a piece for a Jewish journal in which he, in which he titled it. It's a bearded, black hat Orthodox rabbi. And he said, Christians are the new Jews. That's right. That's why we need each other. Jews have to tell the world what's happening to Christians, and Christians have to defend Israel. Christianity started in the Middle East, and Christians are being wiped out of the Middle East, and it doesn't even get reported. It's quite something. And it's part and parcel of this whole thing of you don't, uh, you don't, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to take sides or you feel for the Palestinians. I feel for the Palestinians. So what? I don't base my decision on right and wrong on feelings. <laughs> That's, it has nothing to do with feelings. Of course I feel for Palestinians. Although, I must admit, it's a, it's a bit limited because Palestinians honor the worst people in the world today, people who bomb in the name of God. Here's an interesting exercise for all of you religiously. Think about this and talk it over with your, your friends and your family. What's the worst sin you believe you're, in your religion? What do you believe the worst sin a person can commit? I remember asking the clergy this. I, I knew my answer again from fifth grade. We were taught very clearly by our rabbis, the greatest possible sin is chilul Hashem, is to disgrace God's name in public. How do you disgrace God's name? By acting evilly in God's name. That is the worst sin, at least in Judaism. Those who shout Allahu Akbar as they slit throats of innocent people or bomb pizza parlors are the worst people on earth. They are worse than atheist murderers because they kill God's name. They don't only kill their victims. One of the reasons I am convinced that atheism is so popular among so many today is because of all the evil being committed by Islamists in the name of God. But you can't say that because you're called Islamophobic. The left has created a cordon sanitaire, a, this, this guardian rail against possible totally moral critiques of what's happening in the world of Islam. Of course not all Muslims are terrorists. That doesn't mean anything. Not all Germans were Nazis. So what? So what? It's, it's one of the stupidest arguments I've ever heard. When there's one demonstration against Muslim terrorism in a Muslim country, I will be very happy. That will be a great moment for Islam, not just for the world. Oh, there are, by the way, there are courageous Muslims who hate what's going on. And many of them are killed. These are, these are moral giants. But overwhelmingly, you know, they say, oh, only 10% of the Muslim world supports uh, Muslim terror. That's 100 million people. <laughs> only, only 100 million Muslims support blowing up innocent people in the name of Allah? Oh, okay, now I feel great. <laughs> Got to go to graduate school to feel great with that statistic. <laughs> so we have once again, once again, the clearest moral litmus test of our day is Israel. It's the clearest one. Let me tell you something, folks, this, this stuff. I get calls periodically. Well, Dennis, you know, I really enjoy it, but I got to say, you know, Israel's founding, you know, they, they expelled the Palestinians. It's, it's not right. Israel, Israel's not a legitimate state. So I always ask these people, have you ever called a talk show host and protested Pakistan's founding? Of course, they don't know what I'm talking about. But uh, hey, you know how Pakistan was founded? Do you know, do you know there were 600 to 700,000 Arab refugees uh, from what uh, became the land, or the land of Israel and then what became the state of Israel, okay? And very few were killed. And those that were killed were as a result of Arab attacks on, on the nascent state of Israel. There wouldn't have been any refugee and there wouldn't have been anybody dead if the Arab armies hadn't attacked the Jewish, uh, the Jewish, the nascent Jewish state. 
You know how many were killed in Pakistan when it was ripped out of India? And there is no such thing as Pakistan. It never existed. It's a made-up new name. They created a, 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 an Islamic state, millions of refugees and dead, Hindus and Muslims. Nobody challenges Pakistan's legitimacy. In all the planet, the only country whose legitimacy is challenged is the Jewish state. Now, is that a coincidence? No, it isn't. Of course, that's the fact. That's the basis of it. The most legitimate state in the world, the only one speaking the same language, having the same religion, having the same people, is the Jewish people. The only states that ever existed in the, in the geographic area called Palestine were Jewish states. State one, state two, and now state three, Israel. And yet I interviewed, uh, I interviewed the Palestinian national spokesman in Ramallah just a year and a half ago in Ramallah, denied that there is such a thing as the Jewish people. There is no such, there's Judaism, he admits, there's no Jewish people. Jews have no ties to the land of Israel. That is exactly what is taught in Palestinian schools. Jesus was, as I told the audience earlier, Jesus was a Palestinian. It's the first thing he would have thought of himself, right? If you'd said to him, what are you? He said, huh. I'm a Palestinian, right? Not a Jew. As I pointed out, Hitler and the, and the Nazis said that uh, Jesus was an Aryan. When Jesus is de-Judaized, you know you are in the midst of liars and anti-Semites. So let me just tell you and conclude, this is the, this is the moral litmus test of the day. And if you can't get, you can't get it right on who's right and who's wrong in the Middle East. There's something wrong with your conscience. There is. There's something wrong. You don't think clearly. I don't mean to attack you. You may be a beautiful person otherwise. You may be a beautiful dad and a beautiful mom, beautiful friend. I know that. But you don't think clearly morally. You've read too many New York Times editorials. And I mean it. I don't know how to else to attribute that. This is the state uh, smaller than El Salvador. And, and the UN has condemned Israel more than any other country in the world. North Korea barely gets condemned. Iran barely gets condemned, if ever. Israel, Israel, one of the most humane democracies in the world, that's condemned. Do you know how upside down this world is? So when you, you, you Christians who support Israel, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing on every level, on the level of sheer right and wrong, on the level of religion. There's no, you don't have to apologize. You could be an atheist and understand what I'm saying, but if you're religious, I mean, a Christian who's anti-Israel, I have to say it's, it's as bizarre as a Jew who's anti-Israel. It's just bizarre. There's something wrong with you. There is. I, I don't know what else to say. The, it's, I say it's painful. It's painful. There's something wrong with you. Here's a simple litmus test. Simple. If Israel and the Arab or the Palestinians and the Arab states made the following announcement, same one. We are disarming as of tomorrow noon. If the Palestinians said that, there would be peace by next Wednesday. If the Israelis said that, Israel would be dead by next Wednesday. Is, can you, anyone, anyone deny that? You have to lie to deny that. That's the difference. One wants the other dead. Only one. Every Israeli recognizes the existence of a Palestinian people. Every single one. It's the other, and that's a brand new people, incidentally. That's the irony. There was no Palestinian people historically. There's no such thing. All right, but it, it exists. I have no issue with it. You're a new people? Fine, you're a new people. There are a lot of new countries and new national identities. Benin is a new country in West Africa. If you have a Benin identity, I respect it. But a Benin identity is as old or new as a Palestinian identity. The Palestinians in the 1940s were the Jews. 
the United Jewish Appeal's name was United Palestine Appeal. A lot of people don't know that. So that's why I am so honored to come and speak at the Religious Broadcasters Convention and on behalf of PJTN because they are doing something that honors God. Because remember, I told you, the greatest sin in Judaism is Chilol Hashem, desecrating God's name. And the greatest mitzvah, the greatest good you can do, is to bring sanctity to God's name. When a Christian fights for Israel, that's what he does. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.